turn, if you will, to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, the fifth chapter. And I hope this sermon will be a blessing to you. It certainly is a blessing to me. One reason I like to study the Bible is because there's so many blessings in it. And as I said before, if you get down, you can study the scriptures just a little while and it'll really lift your spirits. The fifth chapter of Romans. And uh, I would like to define a word for you. And I hope by doing this, this will clarify some things in your mind. The word sinner. The word sinner can be either a noun or it can be a verb. But now if it's a verb, it denotes action. If we say that person is sinning or a sinner in that it refers to an action, something that's being done. And so the word sinner can be uh, a verb which denotes the act of doing something, uh, something in progress. Sinner, someone that's sinning. But it's also referred to, and the word sinner can also be a noun, which is in, all, in, in reality, which is a title. And if we say someone is a sinner, that means that's the condition that they are in. That is a title that is attributed to them. And we find in the Holy Scriptures where uh, the writers of the Bible are always referring to people as sinners or to Christians as sinners in the past. But please keep in mind that Christians are never referred to by God in Scripture as sinners. Did you ever notice that? They're referred to as saints. The word saint comes from the word sanctified. Now the reason God never refers to a Christian as a sinner even though he sins is because God is speaking or referring to the position. Now please keep this in mind in studying scripture when we're studying the, the epistles. And I think where a lot of the confusion comes in, some of the passages and in, in, in scriptures are referring to our position in Christ, which is secure. Where other scriptures or passages is referring to our walk with Christ. There's all the difference in the world. You see, I, my position in Christ, my salvation is secure because of my position. My position is that God sees me as righteous, as forgiven, because of the work that Jesus did on the cross and is now doing as intercessor in heaven. God does not see me as a sinner even though I sin. Now, but my practical experience is my walk down here is that I sin and I fail every day. But please keep in mind, as King David said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What does he mean by that? He means that once you are saved, God never charges your position in Christ with sin. As far as God is concerned, Sin is history in the life of a believer as far as your position. You are secure, secure in Christ Jesus. But that does not mean as mortal, having not only the new nature, but we also have the Adam nature, and because of that, we sin, but the new nature is not charged with the sin, but the old Adam nature and the flesh is charged with that sin. But we also know that the flesh goes back to the grave. So this morning, and in this Bible study, we're going to be studying both parts. Not this morning. This morning and for a few services, we're going to be studying our position in Christ. And once you can understand that the scriptures, when he's referring to your position in Christ. And Ken, I know you, and I've known you for a long time. And you come short of perfection as far as your, your walk here, right? Now, don't lie about it, because I'll call a witness. My wife yeah, yeah, your wife, I'll call her up. But that's just the way it is. But as far as your position in Christ, you are holy, you are righteous. Now, that's what we're going to be studying this morning, and will be for a while. 
is our position in Christ. And then we're going to take a look at the Scriptures. You're not off the hook, folks. You're going to find out this, that because of your position in Christ, you are secure. You are eternally secure because of your position in Christ. But as children of God, once saved, you have duties and responsibilities that God expects you to perform. He expects you while here to be holy, completely filled and relying on the power of the, and leadership of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't affect your salvation, but folks, that does, accept, uh, uh, does, that does affect your chastisement. It also affects rewards. It affects fruit bearing. So when you're studying the scriptures, because I know a lot of people say, well, it contradicts itself. The scriptures contradict themselves. The scriptures do not contradict themselves. You just need to know what he's talking about at any given time. All right? Please keep that in mind. Now, this morning, we're going to be studying your position in Christ. And I'll tell you, I said before when I began the service, I hope you can worship. I hope you already are worshiping. I hope right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're praising God for eternal life. If you don't have eternal life, we hope that you do have before you leave here. But uh, as I was studying this, I couldn't keep from worshiping. You know, that's, that's, that's a fruit or a work of the Holy Spirit. As you realize these truths, you realize what God has done for you through Christ Jesus. You can't keep from rejoicing. You can't keep from worshiping God. Now, let's notice here... There's a word that starts out the first verse of the fifth chapter of Romans, and it's a word, that, therefore. I heard a preacher say one time, anytime you see the word therefore, look and see what it's there for. So what the word therefore means is in conclusion to what all he said preceding this. You wouldn't begin a conversation with therefore. I wouldn't just walk up to Bill on the street and say, Bill, therefore... You see, because that wouldn't make sense. If I say, therefore, you know that that's in conclusion or a continuation of what we'd already been talking about. If I would say, if you said, Jerry, you're going on the men's treat, and I said, well, Bill, uh, I sprained my ankle real bad, therefore I can't go, that would make sense. But if you said, are you going on the men's retreat, and I said, therefore I can't go, that wouldn't make any sense. All right. So what Paul means when he said therefore? He means in conclusion. Well, in conclusion of what? Well, you see, the Apostle Paul spent a lot of time and a lot of uh, paper and ink explaining to the church that we are justified by faith. And he gave the illustration of Abraham, who was an old man. God promised him a child. He had a child. The Bible says Abraham believed God, didn't stagger at the promises of God in unbelief, but believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And it says that it was not written for his sake alone, but for all those that believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. They also are justified. And now I can tell by the looks on a lot of your faces, maybe you don't know what justified means. Justified means in the eyes of God, you are not guilty. Folks, you have been to court, the highest court in the, in the universe, and he has declared you not guilty. There is no sin charged against your account. That's what the word justified means. And so he says, goes into all of this, explaining about Abraham and how Abraham was saved. And we find that Abraham was not saved because he was good. He was saved because he believed God. And it says that his faith, his faith was counted for righteousness. Now, he starts out, therefore, in conclusion to what I have already said, being justified, and notice what he says, therefore, or because of all of this, therefore, being justified by what? Faith. Faith. Listen, folks, if you're saved... You are guiltless in the eyes of God because of faith, not because of your works, because you believed on Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, folks, this word peace in this particular instance doesn't mean tranquility of mind. It's good to have peace. It's good to be in a, a relaxed state, in a, in a peaceful situation, a peaceful environment. That's not what he's referring to. This peace means peace as opposed to war. 
You see, what the people, what people don't realize, folks, if you're not saved, you're at war with God. And God is at war with you. The Bible declares that something, there's an animosity between you. And that's a very dangerous position to be in, being who God is. Being that he is omnipotent, being that he is all-powerful, you do not want that kind of a, a, a person or a God angry with you. But the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day, and you are at war. But it says, because of faith, when you believe on Jesus, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he referring to? Because of the work that God did on Calvary, we now have peace. God has reached down through Jesus Christ, took the sinner's hand, Jesus took the sinner's hand and God's hand and brought us together. You see, the vengeance, the wrath of God was satisfied by Christ there on the cross. So now we have peace with God. We're not at war. Where we were enemies, now we're friends. And that's exactly what that means. Now notice something else. By whom, what does it mean by whom? By Jesus Christ, because that is the subject. We have peace because of Jesus Christ. By whom also, not only do we have peace, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now you see another problem is people don't understand what grace is. People do not, it's a five-letter word, but people do not understand the word grace. Now, folks, the word grace does not mean mercy, all right? The word grace contains a mercy, that, but it's far greater word than just mercy. It even means far more than deserved mercy. You see, a lot of people, maybe they've committed a crime, but they deserve mercy because of the circumstances. It does not mean undeserved mercy, although that is a part of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You see, it's not, it's not just the negative aspect of it. There's the positive side. God favors you when you didn't deserve it. Now, I want to give an illustration. Let's assume that I'm walking down the street and I'm on the sidewalk and I'm minding my own business. It's a beautiful spring day. And while walking down the street, there's a big mean dog, comes out of a backyard, runs through the backyard, through the front yard, runs across the street and bites me. I didn't do a thing to that dog. I mean, he takes a chunk out of my leg. I didn't provoke him. He saw me, he deliberately ran over there and bit me for no reason whatsoever. All right, after he bites me, he starts across the street and a car hits him. Boy, he's laying there suffering. Now, you see, if I looked at that dog, I mean, there I'm standing, my leg's bleeding, I'm looking at that dog, I don't owe that dog anything. You know what would probably go through my mind? Good enough for you. You got what you deserved. But you see, undeserved mercy, unmerited mercy would be if I thought, boy, I know he bit me. But he's really crippled up. And he's suffering. And I'm going to take him to the bed and have him put to sleep. And I load him up and put him in my car, blood and all. There I am wounded. I drive to the vet. I walk in with the dog. I lay him down there and I say, uh, he was run, hit, hit by a car and I, I brought him in to have him put to sleep. And here's the $20. Boy, now that'd be unmerited mercy, wouldn't it? Because he bit me. I don't have to do anything for the dog. But because of mercy, because of undeserved mercy, I had mercy on him and I do have put him out of, it, out of his misery. But see, that's not grace. Grace means unmerited favor. See, not only do I pick him up, not only do I take him to a vet, but I say, I want you to check him over. The, the vet x-rays him. He comes back and says, he is really busted up. His, his hip is crushed. Uh, he's got neck damage. He's got internal damage. It's going to take a series of operations. The hip's going to have to be pinned, and it's going to cost about $500 altogether to have it done. This dog just bit me. And I say, go ahead and fix him up. And I'll pay the bill. Now, that's grace. That's grace. See, not only did God have mercy on me, he favored me, and I didn't deserve it. That's grace. 
Now we have access into this grace. Now, now, now please imagine grace is, is this room. Now the door into this room is a, a door. You see, some people think there's something magic about faith. There's nothing magic about faith. A lot of people have faith in faith. Did you know that? Well, I've got enough faith, blah, 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 blah. Listen, faith is nothing unless it's anchored in God. You see, faith is just the access to get you into God's unmerited favor, into the blessings of God. That's grace. Now, notice something. Because of the work that Jesus did on the, Christ, on the cross, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Because of faith, faith is the door, faith is the line that brings us into God's grace. Several years ago when I was a small child, we used to have a streetcar run right by this church, went to Tulsa. And I've ridden that streetcar I don't know how many times, but there's one thing about the streetcar, it run off electricity, and it had a line that, that ran along and it had a pulley, and, it, and there was a high line right above it, and that car wouldn't run unless that high line was, that pulley was rolling down that, that line. That's how it got its power. And I remember coming home from church when we went to Broadway as a little child. Some teenage boys on bicycles were riding along there and they ran up there and they grabbed that rope and they jerked that arm down. Of course, that turned that trolley car off just like that. The conductor had to get up, get out, put that, put that pole back up on that line. You see... Faith is what connects you to God's unmerited favor. That what's Paul, that's what Paul's saying. Now, he can only do that. God can only save you by grace because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he's a just God. But now, here's what I like about this. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. You see, once you're saved, you stand in grace. You're not moving in and out of it. You stand in grace. Because, why? Because of your position. Your position is that you are justified. You are declared innocent. You are declared righteous. You are declared uh, 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 not a sinner by God because of the work that God or Christ did on the cross. Now notice this. And uh, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Folks, I want to tell you something. If it wasn't for God's grace, I could not rejoice this morning. I was telling my wife this morning. I said, I'm glad we're not saved by our works. I, couldn't, I wouldn't have any hope. And you wouldn't either, folks. If your entrance into heaven was determined by your works, you wouldn't have any hope. But because we are saved by grace, God's unmerited favor, then I can rejoice. I can rejoice because by faith I have entered into that grace. I can worship and praise God for his marvelous grace. And I have no merit of what my own. Over here in the other chapter, Paul said, where is boasting then? He said, is it excluded? By what law? Works? No. I can't boast because of work. But he said, by faith. Faith is the only thing. God's grace through faith is the only thing that's going to get me here, get me there. Now notice this. And not only so. Now here, here's another way he says, that it, this is kind of a litmus test. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Now in the Greek, that word glory means we boast. We boast in tribulations. Now that's hard to believe that we would boast in tribulations. Because you see, Keep this in mind. When a Christian goes through tribulations, when a Christian goes through trials, they have an altogether different outlook than when a sinner goes through trials and tribulations. Something marvelous happens when a Christian goes through trials and tribulations. Paul says, for one thing, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. Now notice what it says. When a Christian goes through trials and tribulations... It works patience. Now, this word patience doesn't mean passiveness. It isn't like, I'm just very patient sitting here waiting for a bus to come by. That's not what it means. It means that we have a, a strong, confident, we, we know that God is control, in control. Why? Because I'll tell you why. I don't care what you go through, folks. 
If you're saved and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you know God is with you. You know that God is ruler of the universe and God is going to see you through and bring you out on the other side. And so therefore, you have a strong, confident endurance in that. Then it works experience. Experience. You see, once you've gone through several trials, then you have experience. How many times have you seen someone going through trials and some of you that have been through them, what have you said? Just keep trusting the Lord. He'll see you through it. Boy, I've been down that road, but God will see you through it. And we know that all of us that have been through trials, severe trials in our life, know that God doesn't fail us. Isn't that right? We have experience in that. And keep this in mind, and what's Paul saying, that's one way you know you're saved. Here's something that I've noticed in my lifetime. When a Christian goes through severe trials, it seems to always bring them closer to God. It just does. It always seems to bring them closer to God. When people that aren't saved go through severe trials, they seem to have a bitterness towards God. Why did God do this to me? That just seems to be their attitude. The people that are saved, it always seems to draw them closer to God. That's the way it's designed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. And that does not mean our love for God, but it means with the realization that God loves us. And some of you that have gone through severe trials have told me, I'd have never made it without the Lord. And I've heard Christians that have gone through severe trials say, I don't know how people can make it without the Lord. But I'll tell you what, you as a Christian that have gone through severe trials, when you come through that trial, you're better off for it. Why? Because you know you belong to God and you know that God loves you and God sees you through to, through to the end. Isn't that true? Now, here's what the Apostle Paul, now, now I want to go on, for it, but it says, and, and, and he's talking about hope. It starts out with hope. It starts out with hope. Now, folks, Hope also is a word that can be a verb or a noun. Only 21 places other than in the Psalms it's referred to. It's a verb. Like, boy, I sure hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Well, that would be a verb. See, it's something that it, it, we're denoting an action. But in this place, it's a noun. It's a hope. It's something that's laid up for us. It's like a hope chest. But well, used to, uh, young ladies get ready to get married. Uh, they, they always had a hope chest. And in that, they'd have dishes and stuff. Waiting. See, it was called a hope chest. And so that's what he's referring to. When you're saved, if you're relying on the grace of God, if you're relying on the grace of God, then you have hope. Folks, if you are not relying on the grace of God for salvation, you don't have hope. If you're relying on yourself, you don't have hope because you don't know if you're going to endure to the end or not. Isn't that right? But if you know you're saved by God's grace through faith, then you have hope. Boy, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. You see, and then it goes through this series of tribulations or trials, patience, and it comes right back to hope. In other words, when you go through that, it strengthens your hope just that much more. I know in whom I believe. And Paul says, I've tried him. I've been through the fire. I know in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Man, I've been through the furnace, and I come out as gold tried. That's what Paul's referring to. So you see, we start out when we're first saved. Listen, now you think about this. When I come to Jesus, if I come just saying, God, I, I don't, I'm not good, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Please save me just because of your mercy and because of your grace and because of your love. Well, you see, if that's what my, I'm basing my salvation on, then I have a hope of heaven. Isn't that right? But if I come to God and say, now, God, uh, uh, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'll try to be in church every Sunday, and I'll do anything the pastor asks me to do, well, then the first time you fail, there goes your hope. You'll say, oh, I should have went to church Sunday, and I didn't do it. I wonder if I'm still saved. See? That's what he's talking about. Those, that, those have hope that base their salvation on God's grace. And then when they go through the trials and tribulations, and they realize, yes, God's with me, and he's with me all the way, then what does that do? That increases hope. That increases the hope. We realize that God will never fail us. Now, here's what Paul's basing this on. And it's a good explanation of grace, folks. For when we were yet without strength, in other words, when we were dead, 
You can't get any weaker than that. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In other words, Jesus came when it was time. In the fullness of time, Christ was born of a virgin, went to the old rugged cross. That's what he's referring to. And who did he die for? The ungodly. Do you know who's qualified to be saved? The ungodly. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. And he said, a well man doesn't need a doctor. You know what he's referring to? If you think you're not a sinner, there's no hope for you being saved because I came to save sinners. And folks, the bigger the sinner you are, the better candidate you are. Always remember that. Until you become a sinner, there's no salvation offered to you. Now listen, there wasn't any bigger sinners than the old, than the old Pharisees. But Jesus didn't save them because in their own eyes they were just fine and dandy. But Jesus said, I come to die for sinners. And folks, when you come to the point where you realize you're a sinner. And folks, you'd be surprised how many people are going to church every Sunday that don't realize they're sinners. You see, a lot of people think, well, I never robbed anybody. I never killed anybody. I never did even get drunk. I don't take dope. I don't go to honky-tonks. I'm not a sinner. Well, um, maybe I'm not perfect, but you see, they don't realize that we're sinners. And Jesus said, I came to die for the ungodly. I came to die for sinners. Now, notice something. It says, while we were dead in trespasses and sins. He died for the ungodly. And it says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. In other words, that's a possibility. If there's a possibility that you might die for someone that's righteous, or in other words, a good moral person. You might do that. Or uh, yet, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. Someone that's just good and kind, you might. There's a possibility somebody might. I want you to just, if you will, very quickly, just think of all the people on one hand you die for. Well, I'm, maybe I'm just being honest. <laughs> I love you people. I'm not going to die for you. All right. But he said some might do that. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Now, notice something about yet sinners. Yet sinners. Which implies we're not now. Isn't that right? We're, like if I'd say, you know, when I was a teenager... When I, which implies I'm not now, but when I was. And he says, when we, while we were yet sinners, before we were saved. See, God doesn't see you as a sinner after you're saved. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The dog bit him. He not only took him to the vet and paid the bill, he died for the dog. We're the dog. While we were yet his enemies, he died for us. Boy, that's grace, folks. That's grace. Look at this. Much more than... Oh, I'll tell you what, the Apostle Paul, I believe when he was writing Scripture, of course, he was doing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I believe there was times he just had to lay the pen down and just... Man, I believe he just went into a praise service. I believe, but the reason I believe this, because you see, this didn't come from the Apostle Paul, but it came through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when God was giving him these sacred scriptures to pin down, and he realized what God did for me, he said, and much more, even more than the fact that God loved us while we were yet sinners and died for us. Look, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, I want to go ahead and read this other verse because this other verse explains and, and, and throws light on this, this verse. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, what is Paul saying? He's saying, praise God, if a dying Savior can save you, how much more can a living, exalted Savior keep you? Amen. It's just what he's saying. If he's not saying that, folks, what is he saying? That's what he's saying. 
He said, if a Savior, the work that a weak, beaten, dying, bleeding, and then dead in the tomb, Savior, if the work that was accomplished in his humanity, his humility, and in his death can reconcile you with God, how much more now that he's raised and ever liveth and is at the right hand of God to make intercession for the saints keep you. Woo! Boy, I'll tell you what, that's a powerful God that in his death can save me and bring me together with God the Father. But how much more that now he's in a glorified state at the right hand of God and is constantly making intercession for his people, keep me. No wonder Paul breaks out and prays. No wonder he's always saying, saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Oh, I'll tell you, folks, I praise God that it's by grace because I know my works and I fail Him every day. But the only way God could save me is positionally make me secure. Now, the church's job, your job now, is to make your walk match your position. And Paul spends a lot of time in the Gospels teaching us what we should do and how we should live and how that we should be honest and how we should love one another and not devour one another and not lie to one another so that our walk matches our position. You see, right now, as far as God's concerned, I'm already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's my position. See, my position is I'm completely justified. Now notice this. And not only so. That's twice he says, and not only so. Boy, there's more to come. It just gets better and better. That's what he's saying. And not only so, but we also joy in God. We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the reconciliation. I can joy in God. Folks, I want to tell you something. I praise God this morning. Not because of what I've done for him, but because of what he's done for me. I praise God that he, by grace, saved me. Because I'll tell you what, I didn't deserve it. But I want to tell you something. It says in the first two verses, he not only saved me by his grace, folks, but he keeps me by his grace. Does this make sense? When I was his enemy, and he reconciled me to the Father, now that we're friends, is he going to kick me out? If he loved me when I was ungodly and died for me when I was ungodly, is he going to kick me out now that I'm still not completely sanctified? I'm a lot better than I was. I know it's just hard to believe, but you ought to see me before I was. I'm better than I was. He saved me when I was. Is he going to kick me out? No. Why? It's by grace. All through here, he constantly saying, folks, it's by grace. It's because of God's unmerited favor towards you. You didn't deserve it. You never will deserve it. But he chooses to, to bless those that have faith in his son. You can't do it by your works. You're not that good. I have a cousin that's a builder in Grove, Oklahoma, and he's a good builder. And he said, Jerry, he said, I can go to any house. I can go. He said, I don't care how good a builder is. He said, I can go to the job site. And he said, I can walk around and I can pick that guy to pieces if I want to. He said, I can walk around that house and I can say, now this brick's a little crooked. And this one's sticking out just a little bit. And this vent that he put in down here is just a little bit off. And look at, look at the roof. Look how the shingles aren't completely lined up. He said, I can pick that place to pieces if I want to. And folks, I don't care how good you think you are. You let me follow you around for about 24 hours and I can pick you to pieces. I can pick you to pieces. And you can pick me to pieces. But praise God, it's by grace. It's by grace. You know what Paul's saying? Quit picking people to pieces. Quit devouring one another. You're saved by grace. Just love one another. Love one another. Because he says positionally, in God's eyes, you're secure. You already made it, as far as God's concerned. But he said, children, while you're here, get along. Love one another. Don't lie to one another. Don't steal to one another. Live, try to live up to your position in Christ. But folks, if you're not saved, I'm not even addressing you. 
You see, because you are not, you have not come under God's canopy of grace. But you can. Do you realize this morning you can walk out of here completely justified? Right now, God is at war with you. He's at war with you. He's, he's angry with you. He's furious with you. But you see, because of the work on the cross, you can walk out of here this morning and, 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 and literally and actually say, I'm a friend of God. The war's over. We've made peace. Because of the blood of the cross, peace has been made. And even right now, I know that I'm going to fail. I know that I'm going to fail. But praise God, there in Hebrews it says that he is save, able to save to the uttermost those that come to him through Jesus Christ. You see, and I'm an uttermost. I'm an uttermost. And he ever lives and stands at the right hand of the Father constantly pleading my case.